need your help. There's a, a big rubber button on the mixer that says like Bluetooth connection or something like that. Peg. Good morning, Archbold United Methodist Church. You are miracles of God's grace and mercy, and you are being baptized by the Lord this morning. Uh, we are hopeful that the rain stops based on radar and the forecast that is hour to hour. Uh, however, if it doesn't, you are safe under the shelter. Just please continue to keep your social distance as best as possible under there. If you're in your car and you can't hear, honk. You can hear. Are you good? One hold for yes and two for no. <laughs> and then there's always the Facebook feed. We hope that those of you who continue to join us on Facebook are able to see and hear. I will be checking in on the Facebook feed. I better turn my phone down so that I can uh, uh, not be interrupted during service for that. But uh, I will be checking that for prayer requests. I uh, hope you are also checking in just to say hello to us. And then I also have my phone with me for prayer requests later in the service. So. Uh, it, because it's different and we didn't get to have what we were planning this morning for communion, I will continue to remain here under the shelter uh, until about uh, 1130. 
uh, today or noon, uh, depending on the way the traffic is. If you just send me a message if you need to, uh, to let me know, and I will continue to distribute communion as people arrive. Uh, and hopefully you're able to join us online, but uh, you'll be able to receive when you come here. Um, the pastoral meet and greets are coming up. There's limited seating available at each event. If you are interested in hosting one with your circle of folks in the church, your circle of friends, please let me know about a date and we can uh, get that on the calendar and schedule together uh, if you're interested in hosting. I know that several of the folks on the leadership team are hosting uh, these events as well. Um, and I think that's all the announcements I have this morning. We're gonna try to get through service and uh, we're not, trying to rush through it, but we're also trying to keep ourselves uh, dry as possible. So for that, I'll hand it over to Susie. Quick question, is there perhaps anybody in their cars who didn't get communion? Oh, if, if you have not gotten communion yet, uh, go ahead and give a honk. Anybody in your cars? All right, sounds like everybody's gotten, uh, but if at any time at all you need that, just just let us know somehow, and uh, there are folks tra traveling around to be able to distribute that. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This morning, let us take a moment to just quiet ourselves and focus our hearts and our minds on this time of worship together. Our focus this morning is taken from the Psalms, Psalm 116, verses 1 through 4, and verses 12 through 19. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress, distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, save my life. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious is the sight of the Lord. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving maid. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. And now let us pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the bread of life. Let us feast on you and find nourishment for our souls. You are the light of the world. Let us follow you out of the darkness. You are the door. Let us enter the Father's presence in your name. You are the good shepherd. Let us rest in your provision. You are the resurrection and the life. Let us find true life and victory in you. You are the way, the truth and the life. Let us love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus, in your holy name, we pray all these things. Amen. Now let us continue our worship as we join in singing this morning our song of praise, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Mm -hmm.
we prepare for prayer this morning, I uh, wanted to give a programming note. We're going to do the Lord's Prayer later in the service, and instead of doing it twice, we're, we're not going to be doing it at this point in the service, just to, just to let you know. Uh, so we're skipping it for now, but don't be offended. We will come back to it. I am checking the uh, feed here to see if there are any messages. All right, I don't see any prayer requests there, and I have not gotten any texts yet. Um, wanted to give a shout out, and let's pray for Matt. Thank you, Matt, for braving the weather there and uh, keeping the live feed up. Everybody who's watching out there, you can give a big shout to Matt on the live feed for that. And Nancy, thank you for walking around and passing out stuff to folks who are still in their cars and checking on them. We appreciate your service. Um, not, not hearing or seeing any prayer requests, we're going to go ahead and pray to God. Let us bow our heads. Elusive God, companion upon our way, you walk behind us and beside us and beyond us. You catch us unaware. You break through our disillusionment and our despair when it clouds our vision. And you give us wide-eyed wonder that we can find you on our way and that you will guide us on the journey and make us messengers of your good news and hope to all people. As we come together today, we thank you for the rain that, that, that is watering the ground, that is uh, helping to uh, green the grass and the vegetation to grow for the farmers. We give you praise this morning for those who are able to serve in difficult circumstances and that we can roll with the punches, Lord. And as we are able to continue to gather together in this wide space to praise your name this morning. And so as we come today, we continue to ask your blessings on us and pray that you would guide us with each and every step of our journey. In Christ's name, amen. All right, I think... Uh, we, uh, for the children's message this morning, we have our kiddos uh, and my five are here, and they're going to sing a song from VBS for you. So let's see here. Where are they going to stand? I think up here, and we can maybe pull them right here. Yeah, okay. We're going to reset the stage real quick. to tell you a little bit about what they did this week at Vacation Bible School. Yeah, so I kind of had my own class um, for VBS this year. I'm not really used to that. I said I, I missed the part where we drop kids off. I don't know why we didn't get to do that this year. But anyways, so we did crafts and we did stories, right? And we sang songs. And we had a lot of crazy, and we had snacks. That was such a surprise. I didn't notice that until the second day. So we didn't have snacks the first day. <laughs> but we did the second day. We had snacks. So anyways, we had a good time um, learning a lot about Jesus' power and how it can help us. And so here, get ready. This is Jesus. Are you ready? So the first day we learned that Jesus' power helps us do hard things. Trust Jesus. Day two was Jesus' power gives us hope. Trust Jesus. Then Jesus' power helps us be bold. Trust Jesus. Day four, we learn that Jesus' power lets us live forever. Trust Jesus. And finally, Jesus' power helps us be good friends. Trust Jesus. And so they had a lot of fun, and I hope the kids um, that you're watching or that participated this week also had a good time. Um, we're thankful for everyone who made it happen because it wasn't a traditional kind of VBS, but thankful for people who took the time to um, make those videos, who um, to lead us and craft a story, who put together the packets for us. Big thanks to all you guys. It was a great, great week for us. So we're going to sing a song, right?
Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven, and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks.
Chillicothe, and uh, Chillicothe is her hometown, and it goes back generations that her uh, family is there, so there's there's relatives all over the place, and I can remember being in uh, Kroger's at times, and looking at the other end of an aisle, just catching the glimpse of someone, and uh, leaning over to Emily and say, hey, is that one of yours? And, and I'd get the elbow in the side and say, no, that's not, and quit it. Um, you know, there, there's studies that tell us that our brains are programmed to remember faces. Even if it's someone that we have never met before, uh, our brains want to place the face. Sometimes we can't place a face because we should know them, but we just can't do it. And they obviously know us. They come up to us and tell us our life story. They tell us everything about us, and it's like we're long-lost friends. But the whole time they're shaking our hands, we're like, I have no idea who you are. And we're hoping that if we keep shaking our heads and nodding long enough, a marble's going to shake loose. And then all of a sudden, it's going to be like, oh, now I remember. Luke shares a story about two disciples in his gospel who had this very experience the day of Jesus' resurrection, on Easter Sunday, as they were walking to a village called Emmaus that's just outside Jerusalem. It's a story that's been so powerful and meaningful in the church that we have to walk to Emmaus community today that has spiritual retreats for renewal. Are, are there any Emmaus alumni? We've got one here. Anybody there? Any, if you've been Emmaus alumni and you're in the car, you can honk. Oh, okay. So we got at least one here. You said some folks know Emmaus. A couple things strike me as funny in this passage uh, as you prepare for it. Cleopas and his buddy are obviously some people who have history with Jesus. 
They had some measure of faith, some knowledge of Jesus, and they had a little bit of hope. Yet these two disciples have some major issues with their discipleship, their ability to follow Jesus. And the first major issue that we can see in the passage is that they're walking to Emmaus. They're walking seven miles away from all of their friends and all of the support of Jesus' followers that are back in Jerusalem. Everyone who would love them intensely during this time of loss, they have abandoned. The second symptom is, is that they're allowing their disappointment and their despair to cloud everything that had happened when it comes to Jesus' crucifixion, and it's ruling their behavior, disappointment. You see, having some measure of faith and just a little bit of knowing and just a little bit of hope in Jesus is not enough. Jesus starts to correct them right away. He says, how foolish are you and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken? You see, their faith, their knowledge, and their hope was misguided. They said Jesus was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Now, you, you need to read between the lines there because that's first century speak in Jewish uh, code for kick the Romans out. That's what they were saying. All the time that these two men had spent with Jesus, and we're going to get to how long in just a moment, all that time and they never realized who Jesus was. Obviously they didn't recognize Jesus physically at that moment. He was walking alongside the road with them and they didn't know it was him. However, this scene from scripture is showing us a little bit more than just that moment of not recognizing Jesus and how the disciples didn't know that he had raised from the dead after he'd been killed. No, Jesus' identity was hidden from these two because they never recognized who Jesus was to begin with. Their blindness to the resurrected Christ was the same blindness, spiritually speaking, of everything that Jesus ever did. All those words and deeds that they had mentioned as they were walking along the road of everything that Jesus ever said or did in front of them. They couldn't see the forest for the trees. This scene is a living parable, and Cleopas and his friend are standing in for all the disciples who, like them, never actually had an encounter with Jesus Christ. Now, here's the thought that struck out to me. If you go to some of Barna's research, and I admit that the research is uh, pre-pandemic, and things have changed quite a bit since then, but uh, six out of ten Americans describe themselves as Christians, yet among the same group of ten, six out of ten have not read their Bible in the past week. Eight out of ten have not volunteered at church, attended Sunday school, or participated in some small group or something like a Bible study. And I would say that those same six people today are like Cleopas and his friend. They have some measure of faith. They know of Jesus, and they even have a little hope in Jesus, and these are all good things. But if Jesus were to walk up beside them today, because they never recognized him before, they wouldn't know it now. According to the research, six out of ten Americans describe themselves as Christians, and two out of ten actually put feet on their faith. Now notice, I don't want to question their salvation. Luke recognizes Cleopas and his friend as two of them, two disciples of Jesus Christ. Jesus likewise called them foolish and not hypocrites. Foolish was only, deserved, only reserved for the disciples in the gospel. He would only call his disciples foolish when they needed a little bit of a push in the right direction. The word hypocrite in the gospels is reserved for the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those who had rejected Jesus outright. So what's my point? What do I see in Cleopas and his friend that brought to my mind today? If six out of ten Christ uh, Americans are truly Christian, then our country would be a very different place. And besides for the pandemic, our churches would be full. The park would be full besides rain. Virtual feeds would be breaking the Internet left and right. And if we were having parking lot services, we'd have to have multiple ones to fit all the cars. We'd be full of on-fire believers in all of these areas and encountering Jesus and able to recognize him in every circumstance of our life. Yet because we're spiritually blinded by sin in our world, 
And I'm not talking about people just outside the church, but those of us inside the church can be blinded as well. That's why when we have communion, we confess together, most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. You have, we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Six out of ten Americans claim to have faith, knowledge, and hope in Jesus. And some of these even attend church. By our fruit, we have trouble recognizing Jesus when he shows up. This passage doesn't leave us there. There's always good news in the gospel. Jesus comes to us. Jesus explains it to us. And Jesus helps us so that we can recognize him. It is by God's grace that we are saved and are being saved at this very moment. Every day we are alive, God's grace is working on us a little more and more. Every morning we have another opportunity to walk life's journey with Jesus alongside of us. That's good news. We're not alone. Jesus isn't going to let us walk away to our little villages isolated and alone with what little faith, what little knowledge, and what little hope we have doesn't work out the way that we plan or think that it should. And just like Cleopas and his friend, Jesus is not content to leave us where we are or where we might be going on our own. When a little bit of faith and a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of hope are good things, but they're not enough. A beautiful part of our communion liturgy says this. When we turned away, when we started for our own Emmaus and our love failed, your love remain steadfast. When what we have fails, God's strength shines through. The Apostle Paul wrote, my strength is made perfect in weakness. The father of the demon-possessed little boy, when he was struggling to understand why his child had not been healed by the disciples, and Jesus says, I can do it. He said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Out of all of those numbers that concern me about the Varna survey, the fact that six out of ten Americans, the same number as claim to be Christians, readily admit that they haven't read their Bible in a long time. And that bothers me the most because when Jesus comes to Cleopas and his friend, it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, that's the Old Testament, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. If you want to grow up to be big and strong spiritually, then start with the good spiritual diet and read your Bible. The good news is, is that Jesus explains himself to us in his word. And what little bit of faith, what little bit of knowledge, and what little bit of hope can grow into something so much more. And we can trust in his promise to meet us in his word. Jesus comes to us. Jesus will explain things to us. And finally, Jesus helps us remember Here's something that's a bit funny about Jesus gathering at the table with Cleopas and his friend. He took bread, he lifted it up, gave thanks, he broke it, and then he gave it to them. And that's the liturgy that we have for communion, the Last Supper, to take, think, break, and give. And as soon as Jesus did that, Cleopas and his friend were able to recognize Jesus, and then he's gone. Okay, here's the rub with that. Matthew and Mark specifically tell us that at the Last Supper in the upper room, it was just the 12 disciples with Jesus around the table. And Luke says it was the apostles, which earlier he told us were the 12. And John's language goes back and forth on, the, on who's a disciple and which he's referring to, so he uses it interchangeably. Cleopas and this other guy were obviously, though, not in the upper room. So what are they recognizing when Jesus takes bread, he gives thanks, he breaks it, and then he blesses it and gives it to them? So you all remember another story in Scripture where Jesus takes some bread and he takes some fish. And he's along the shore of Galilee and a little boy comes up and says, this is what I've got. No one else has any food but I'll share this with all 5,000 people. Two fish and five loaves of bread. So Jesus takes the fish and the bread, and he 
raises it up to the Father. He blesses it. He breaks it into pieces and fills the baskets with the disciples. And they go out and they give it to the people. And everyone eats. Did anybody walk away hungry that day? Everybody had their fill. And not only did everybody have their fill, but they took those baskets back out and they filled 12 baskets full of broken pieces of bread and fish. Maybe it was something that was naughty loose because they were like, we have no idea who this guy is. We're just going to keep shaking our head and act like we know him, but we don't. And finally, as Jesus breaks the bread, the veil that was in front of their eyes was torn open, and the most profound encounter that they had with Jesus Christ in his living life on this earth they recognize him from the Sea of Galilee. And when Jesus offers the bread to them, the truest moment of their discipleship from that shore break forth in their memory, and their eyes are open, and they see Jesus. It was only to the twelve that Jesus told the story, do this as often as you do in remembrance of me. Jesus is always with us. Jesus is always ready to carry us into a deeper relationship with himself. Yet as long as we remain spiritually blind, we may never get the opportunity to encounter the risen Christ. So Jesus left us a legacy, a way to be remembered. And so, as our, as our practice on the first Sunday of every month, we take bread and we take cup. We offer thanks for the bread and the cup, and we break the bread, and then we give the bread and the cup. Take, thanks, break, and give. This is the way that Jesus chose to be remembered. I could explain it to little children like this, that Jesus loves us so much that he wanted to make sure that you had this little bit of bread and this little bit of juice so that you never forget how much he cares for you. This is his legacy. Let us be ready, church. Our Savior is present. Let's pray. <clears throat> Most gracious Lord and merciful Savior, we know that you are present here with us at this very moment. In your word, we have seen how you desire for us to increase in our faith, knowledge, and hope of you. Jesus, we simply call this our love for you. Help us to love you more. Now, as we enter into this time of remembrance, this moment to celebrate your legacy, to help us to recognize, to see, and receive you, us to see that you are very much present with us at this table. It is in your name, the name that is above every name that we pray. Amen. I invite you to go ahead and reach into those baggies and grab out your elements. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly seek to grow in his likeness. So let us draw near in faith and make a humble confession and prepare to receive this holy sacrament as we join our hearts in prayer. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own goodness, but in your unfailing mercies. We are not worthy that you should receive us, but give your word and we shall be healed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Here's the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You made us in your image to love and to be loved. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymns, saying, Holy, holy Lord, God in power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Hosanna in the highest. By the suffering, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, who delivered us from slavery, sin, and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave thanks to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here under these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to go ahead and remove that first seal so you can get to the wafer. And when you're ready, go ahead and try to hold it up so that I know that everybody has it and we'll protect together. through the tree there. I think everybody's ready there. So let us partake the body of Christ given for you. Now you can remove that second seal. And when you have done so, hold it up together and Shed for you and for me for the forgiveness for the forgiveness of sins. Take, drink, and be thankful. I invite you to join me in the closing prayer of the communion service. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
go from this place. Those who are watching on the live feed, I remind you that we'll be here for about another hour. Uh, so just pull up here on Holland Street, give a honk, and I will run uh, the elements out to you so that you can join in with us today as you have participated in worship virtually. You can join in with that, and we will see you there shortly. Also, uh, next week, we had hoped uh, it was a goal to be back in the sanctuary. Uh, right now, that's a little iffy. We don't know. There's a lot of work to do still. And if it does get done, we'll be there. You'll get an announcement video on Facebook and through one call and the newsletter on Friday about that for sure. Uh, but uh, right now, we will probably be back here in the park. So continue to pray for dry weather. I know it didn't work out quite that much this week, but uh, we are thankful for Matt and for Nancy for their efforts and also for the lovely shelter that uh, we have in this community to be able to worship today outdoors. With that, I leave you with the benediction. Now may the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ the Son, and the communion of the Spirit write a story in your life that is just too good not to share with those who do not know of the saving power of Jesus. Amen.